Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me for this search session. I'm very happy to be able to join again uh, this wonderful event, which is uh, Berlin Buzzwords in person again. Um, I would like to share with you um, in this session um, a news case, um, search uh, engine use case, which is uh, uh, quite interesting. I find it quite interesting because the particularity of the data. So let's get into details and let's search through large graphs using Elasticsearch. Uh, I will just take a couple of moments to introduce myself and my team, Adeline. Uh, we are search um, enthusiasts, uh, integrators of uh, Elasticsearch and uh, Solar. We provide uh, consultancy services and training. Um, we are also developers of um, our search engine solution, we call it A2, um, and we uh, oversee the integration of search technology for e-commerce and uh, uh, enterprise search. I'm um, a solution architect inside of this team. Um, I'm, my mainly uh, interests are related to uh, uh, ELK uh, stack globally, uh, A2 search engine, and uh, also search uh, relevance uh, that I, uh, I like to improve in different uh, use cases that I encounter. But this uh, talk is about um, a project at uh, INA. Uh, so this is my second hat that uh, I'm a search consultant in, in this team. Um, I'm an Elasticsearch expert, and I joined the Data Lake uh, project of, uh, of this institute which uh, in just one slide, uh, to give you um, an idea about what uh, we do, what it is about, it is a huge repository. It is the national um, repository for everything that's audio and visual, uh, broadcasted for more than 180 radio and television uh, channels, um, collected, archived, and preserved 24 hours, 24-7. Um, and this is just to give you some figures to have a global idea about the volume of, of data that we are generating, uh, more than 22 million hours of uh, video content that generates behind more than 1.1 billion views. People can access different parts of the archives. Uh, there are 1.2 million uh, photos. There are thousands of uh, archived websites. Uh, so globally, you can uh, visualize this uh, repository like a, that picture that I like uh, to show, like long corridors of uh, drawers where you store lots of tapes. That was uh, some while ago. Now you have long corridors of servers. And, but the idea is the, the same, to collect and preserve this content. So why is it interesting? Uh, it's because um, on the search engine uh, or a search uh, solution, this is um, a quite interesting volume of data to, uh, to play with. And um, the project, the, the institute is very large. It has different areas. But our focus, our team, is uh, related, strictly relating to hosting uh, these over 50 million uh, documents. And when, I, uh, uh, when I'm talking about documents, I refer to the metadata. So we are not dealing with the pure content, the, audio, the audios and the videos and the files that are stored in, in the archive. So purely uh, from the data point of view of the metadata describing this, uh, this content, um, it's a typical three-layer architecture, if I, if I can call it like that. We, uh, um, we are handling the storage of different heterogeneous databases. Uh, there is a middle layer of processing that um, uh, uh, tackles the, the updates, the transformations, uh, uh, curator, uh, curating activities that need to be done on the data, uh, the synchronization of different uh, sources of data, and so on. And then the third layer is the management. So in, besides the access, the monitor, our focus is uh, the search, search part, so the, the capability of uh, searching through all these uh, metadata generated by uh, the video and audio content. I will just want to give credit to my team in, at INA, Gauthier, Colin, and uh, Stanislas, which are uh, the members that uh, initially uh, um, uh, put in place the project, and they are there for quite a long time. And uh, let's start with the definition of the model, because this is the key part of, uh, uh, of our use case. Um, 
What's very important to uh, distinguish uh, is that the content uh, has three different point of views. We have the content, the event, and media. What does it represent? If we take a simple example of um, the daily uh, news, that are broad which is broadcasted uh, each and every evening at a precise hour on the national uh, French uh, broadcasting channel, uh, this is the video content, so half an hour of uh, video content where you, you have the news. Um, uh, it implies, of course, uh, some snapshots, some images related, or uh, text uh, defining different parts of, of the content, uh, maybe a summary, maybe some uh, a list of um, uh, people that are, produce, uh, are presenting, or uh, guests, or so on. Um, so this is the pure content, but then the idea is that this content has different events associated to it. So it's important to dissociate uh, the event or the temporal uh, point of view on, on the data because for some contents, or most of them, uh, this is a key um, aspect because it, you can have several uh, events uh, related uh, to, to that and uh, the, the curators or people uh, willing to inquire into the, into the repository, they might be interested in particular uh, uh, moments in time. And lastly but not the least, the, the media represents the support of, uh, uh, of this content and um, in, in the institute uh, repository this could be a very uh, a range, a broad of uh, different kinds of support. It could be uh, even the tapes, the uh, old uh, uh, Betacam, VHS. Uh, it could be files, uh, MP3, MP4, uh, image uh, files, uh, and so on, or uh, the, the web archives. So these are the three uh, different point of views that describe uh, uh, the data. Now, um, the data... Um, can contain different, uh, different parts. Uh, it can contain a free text that can have uh, a title, summary, notes. So uh, purely a text that can be added by different uh, contributors with uh, unstructured, in an unstructured manner. So it can be basically anything. Then on top of that, uh, we can have curated data because uh, Historically, uh, data was organized in different categories. There are different relations in between different entities and so on. There are descriptors, there are concepts, uh, different ontologies. So on top of the uh, free text, we have um, uh, the curated uh, data that uh, the completes the, the, the meta, metadata. And again, we have the three parts. We have the content in itself. We have uh, some uh, metadata associated to each uh, material, uh, which uh, to each uh, physical recording uh, uh, support, and then there could be some uh, um, metadata uh, associated to specific events. So when we put all this together, we came up with a global global schema that looks something like this. Um, it's a simplified view of uh, all different entities that are part of this model. But what's interesting is that uh, that gives you already the overview and the intuition that behind all this model there is basically a graph. There is a large graph with different relations in between entities. Um, if I take the example earlier on with the, the, the news, um, the news could be in the central instance, which has associated a certain number of annotations, uh, relations to different content, concepts on top. There are texts, uh, free texts associated, um, the events uh, at the bottom of the schema, and so on and so forth. So now um, we we have the, the, the abstract data model. Uh, we have to, in order to um, uh, be able to search and use it, uh, we have to find the transposition, the associated uh, transposition into a relational uh, database model with a fairly complex uh, database, database schema. But we also need a document representation of the model to be able to index it into a search engine. Now, this is the first challenge that came into, uh, 
into place because uh, how do we do that? Uh, what would be the um, most efficient way to do a transposition from a graph, um, typic typically a large graph, into uh, flat documents and documents that could be rather small, so the indexing process could be uh, fast enough, but also the search uh, in a search engine could, be, uh, could, could have uh, reasonable uh, performance. So one uh, simple observation was to split this uh, graph. Uh, instead of putting everything together in a single index, we decided to uh, use only a, a certain subset of these elements. And based on some decisions uh, to do this split um, and to minimize the number of uh, entities that can be uh, placed into uh, a given index. Of course, this split is not, was not done randomly. It was based on uh, different um, requirements from the, the stakeholders, from the curators, or from people using the application and the search. And they um, suggested different ways of organizing the data, different splits of the data. We could have, for instance, an index dedicated to general concepts with all the relations in between different concepts. Then another index uh, that um, organizes the uh, instances, different uh, video audio content, but independently of, of their uh, event associated. And then a separate index for the events, which will have relations backwards to the instances uh, in this. So that was the, f the first idea. Not very uh, sophisticated, but quite efficient, because that reduces the, uh, the work needed to, um, to index the whole amount of uh, data. This schema uh, shows uh, the workflow that is put in place, a quite straightforward uh, workflow. Um, but there are some specificities, uh, especially on the left part where we symbolize different uh, databases. Um, we have to, picture, uh, to imagine the, the diversity of these databases. We have different legacy uh, databases, uh, different, um, uh, different data that was um, imported and transformed uh, all over uh, the, the years, even decades. So it's a mixture of different things, different technologies. Uh, of course, um, extracting this data can be specific to each and every source. We, uh, we have a first logical uh, step to put everything in, uh, into a relational database, PostgreSQL, for instance. And then we take everything and we index into Elasticsearch. We did this uh, experience in the early stages of the, of the project. And um, I'm um, doing it on purpose not to mention about the, the document database that we put in between, because we thought um, everything will work, we'll, it, it will be a simple workflow, but in the real uh, scenario with the, the whole amount of data that uh, needs to be indexed, the whole process uh, uh, lasted for three weeks. So we, we uh, realized that it cannot, we, we have to come up with a, uh, with a solution to shorten this project, uh, this process, because for different updates or different uh, load of the data for a full uh, amount, uh, it cannot be. Um, uh, it, it's not an accept, uh, acceptable uh, amount of time for a process to to last for years and weeks and so on. So we came up with an intermediary uh, step um, using a document uh, database, MongoDB, where we stored fragments of this uh, data. Uh, and I will come back with more details on that. So there, there are some JSON fragments that are temporarily stored in this uh, uh, database and then loaded in, into the search engine. Of course, there are some um, optimi optimization that was done uh, on the SQL uh, queries. Uh, there are some um, tricks uh, that can be applied at the level of the, uh, of the fragments uh, using a fragment schema. So, Let's see all this in the next couple of slides. So if I come back to the three different mod data, data model representation, uh, we have uh, the relational view, then 
this JSON fragment view, and at the end is the result, the, the JSON documents that are finally stored into Elasticsearch. So um, here, uh, what, what's uh, useful uh, to have a, a generic schema is that you can um, you can define in a very uh, modular and uh, very flexible way to uh, restructure your, da your data, if you want. So in, in this example, uh, my schema int integrates some texts, some identifiers, some concepts, events, but all these um, uh, all these elements are um, are added or uh, uh, removed from the schema in, to, in a declarative way. So we don't have to uh, rebuild our uh, indexing uh, jobs or we don't have to write code to define a new data model or a, a different process. So applying this uh, intermediary step, we can obtain uh, a fairly uh, simple document because we extract only the, um, the necessary uh, fields and data elements that are necessary afterwards for, for the search engine. So not all the, data, all the metadata is used for the typical uh, search that uh, are um, in, in the needs of, of the stakeholders. And uh, what you can see here in, um, in this example is uh, it's um, uh, the, the complexity and the different imbrication of uh, the different uh, sub-elements of uh, schema that can be declared with, uh, with the JSON fragments. So uh, if I take the example of the events, the events, they can uh, contain uh, another sub-schema that can have uh, associated texts, associated identifiers, uh, associated uh, agents, which represents different um, uh, persons in, in the ontology of, uh, of persons that are registered in, in the data. The fragment schema is uh, inspired from uh, GAQL, but uh, as I said, it's a declarative method uh, for defining a, a document structure and to implement different re, uh, relations between entities. Um, but we, we have our own implementation to be able to, uh, to do some optimization in terms of uh, the, the depth of uh, different relations, uh, in terms of reusing the, um, the extraction uh, process of uh, specific parts, like for the text, like for identifiers. You can see that uh, there are text and identifiers uh, repeatedly associated to other elements. So there is a, a common part of the process that can be reused in different parts of the schema. And uh, just to illustrate all, all this uh, uh, process of uh, transforming and uh, building the final document, you can see from a simple schema of uh, 16 lines of, uh, of elements, de declarative elements, we can get to around 80 lines of uh, um, data and fields associated to the final document, starting from uh, an entity which we defined as an instance, having text, identifiers, and, and so on. Um, just to illustrate this corresponds um, to a fairly complex SQL um, uh, query, but um, the advantage is that once that this is done and stored in the document uh, database, it will be uh, very uh, fast afterwards to index it in, in Elasticsearch. So the, the most difficult, if, if I may say, the uh, part of the process is already uh, prepared in, in a preliminary phase when, when we construct these fragments. Um, GSLT, GSLT transformations, uh, is anyone familiar with uh, this? Uh, do you ever uh, maybe used uh, this library? No, anyone? Yeah, several people. Um, so it's a query and transformation language for JSON. Uh, it's inspired by uh, JQ, the XPath and uh, XQuery. Um, it's a simple and uh, very fast uh, JSON uh, processing 
um, and I would say it's much easier than a full programming language. Of course, we can imagine this transformation in any other language that uh, we, we want in Java, in Python. And, but uh, this library, uh, it's, uh, it's very fast, it's declarative, and it can be uh, used without having to uh, maintain a very complex uh, code. And this is um, the advantage of using that is that um, more people from the team could be part of uh, uh, these transformations that are done directly on, on the, the JSON documents. And different extensions can be easily added to, to obtain the final result. So the main uh, transformations that we do uh, using this library is, of course, to obtain these flat uh, JSON documents to trim different elements that are not explicitly needed for the search engine and to group, restructure a bit uh, the, the final list of objects, uh, um, uh, maps, and, and so on. Just uh, uh, to illustrate very simple parts of uh, uh, this G GSLT uh, code. It's a de declarative way of uh, defining functions. Uh, we manage uh, di different loops, different uh, variables. Uh, so it's, it's really, uh, really easy to, uh, to get a grip on it and to, to do some simple transformations. So I was talking about um, the data in itself and how it is uh, transformed and uh, um, to, to get to the final uh, state of, of the documents. Now, of course, we, uh, we needed a way of doing this uh, in, a, in an automatic manner because we cannot just uh, launch uh, processes whenever we need to add a new collection in, uh, in, in, the, in the index. So uh, there are some uh, jobs that are uh, described in a um, a declarative manner, uh, asynchronous and asynchronous jobs. Um, they are triggered either by a direct web service calls or they are, we are using um, AMQP uh, messaging queues. Um, and uh, all these, uh, these jobs are uh, uh, orchestrated because some of the process um, might trigger uh, different su subsequent uh, processes to collect sub-collections of, uh, of different entities. Um, we, used, uh, we needed a framework. We were looking for a framework to do all this in an automatic manner. We used the uh, talent framework. Um, the advantage is that um, one of the advantage would be that uh, we have this interface that allows you to register uh, once they are declared, uh, to register the jobs and to um, uh, trigger them and to um, plan a, a certain, uh, to schedule different uh, activities uh, in each and every day to do the updates, for instance. And also, as shown here at the bottom, to pass different arguments so that we can define a generic uh, um, job, for instance, for the index of a list of IDs, no matter what kind of generic IDs. We just give the parameter of uh, the type of IDs and the reference to the collection in MongoDB. And then the same job applies to different uh, collections. So just to to give you an idea of uh, how this is implemented in, and orchestrated. Um, and uh, another um, facility that we have is that uh, the definition of jobs uh, can be done in, uh, even in an uh, in uh, editor with uh, different predefined uh, uh, actions. And uh, the, the advantage of that is that uh, people uh, are not required to be uh, developers or um, to have a very um, to have uh, uh, skills of uh, implementing uh, different processes. It can be really uh, done in in the uh, in the editor and use. They can use uh, predefined uh, jobs. They, in this example, there is an uh, the the description of an asynchronous job that uh, reads um, the reads the it reads the parameters from the message uh, queue. Uh, it uh, starts uh, the initialization of the process. Um, then uh, in this part, 
you uh, check the existence of an index in, uh, uh, in the Elasticsearch cluster. According to all this uh, preparation, there is a split of uh, the list of all the IDs. Um, there are sublists that are uh, sent to the indexing uh, part and and uh, that's it. So um, just uh, an example of uh, a typical indexing uh, uh, job that we use. Um, in, up to now, I was talking about the indexing part, which is very important and uh, um, very uh, time consuming because of the uh, volume of the data. But on the other hand, we had to prepare the search uh, API, the search facilities that are directly uh, deducted from uh, the, the needs expressed by, uh, by the stakeholders. Um, and uh, the first uh, need of uh, providing um, a search API was, of course, to uh, provide a simplified version of, uh, um, of the search facility to the application layer. Basically, um, we are implementing some uh, full text search, uh, some filters, uh, facets, uh, um, sort uh, rules, and this uh, preserves uh, a very abstract uh, level of the um, uh, query DSL uh, provided by Elasticsearch. So basically, uh, it's easier for the integration with the application uh, layer to de define uh, simpler uh, queries. And I will come back with some examples to, uh, to illustrate that. Um, another important role of uh, the API is to uh, uh, separate and to confine uh, the access to the Elasticsearch cluster. Um, several uh, reasons for that. It's also because the cluster uh, uh, can uh, be shared by different uh, collection, by different indices, and if ever there are some, uh, some uh, extra load on s some specific uh, collection, it should not uh, impact all the other uh, collections and the, the totality of the cluster. And also uh, to protect the um, usage of Elasticsearch queries into, from um, uh, um, an excessive uh, usage of very complex uh, queries that can be, uh, that can be uh, combined. Um, we defined some uh, generic uh, categories of uh, functionalities uh, based on, on the request um, uh, from the application get by ID, full text search, advanced uh, search, autocomplete. Auto um, and also we uh, use, uh, again, the GSLT uh, transformation to build the final Elasticsearch query. So basically for, from a simple uh, the search API, this is uh, um, the starting point for the final Elasticsearch uh, query. And the example, uh, for a simple query, a full text on the left, those 20 lines with just a, a text, a full text search um, that um, requires a filter on the date, uh, then a group by event, uh, by different uh, intervals, uh, different persons that can be part of, uh, of this query, uh, um, a rule of uh, uh, sorting the results. So uh, on the right side, you can see uh, the real Elasticsearch query, which expands up to almost 300 lines. So uh, you can see here the, the facility that the Search API provides to the application. So no need to get into detail uh, syntax of Elasticsearch, no need to know the, uh, what's under the hood and the, the, the data structures uh, like nested objects or different other joints or different other uh, specific queries uh, that are required. Everything is a very uh, generic uh, level. And again, a simple illustration of uh, the language to do that. Uh, simple generic blocks that, uh, of code or that can be reused um, in different parts. And um, uh, we can recognize uh, the, the final um, elements of the Elasticsearch queries, like uh, uh, from, size, uh, highlight, uh, AGS, uh, and so on. The workflow essentially is uh, organized in three parts. There is a query validation that uh, 
among others, uh, defines the, the pagination rules, uh, can, uh, allows to specify a particular language because uh, different documents can have uh, several languages in, in the repository, um, specific operators for search. Um, then the second part, which is the most uh, uh, consistent, is the transformation of the query. Uh, with the definition of the list of filters that are required, different uh, profiles that can be associated to uh, different users of the application, um, aggregations, sort rules, and so on. And finally, uh, it's also important to be able to do a um, um, presentation of the results, but in a very uh, brief uh, manner, uh, trimming all the uh, elements that are not, uh, not really necessary and that can be uh, defined uh, at the application layer. So basically, the, the application can select parts of uh, the documents that need to be uh, shown in, in the application. We can also uh, present a highlight uh, snippets, uh, the pagination, and uh, different ways of uh, showing the aggregation, especially for the aggregation that can, be go, can go in several layers of imbrication. Um, so all that uh, brings us to uh, the architecture. Um, on the top, right top level is the, the application uh, that uh, um, that uh, inter in interacts with uh, uh, the search API uh, to a controller. This is just for the definition of uh, different uh, rights to access uh, the, search, the search engine. Then we have the search engine that works as a Spring Boot um, uh, microservice, can be deployed easily in, in our infrastructure in uh, several uh, nodes in, a, in the Kubernetes uh, cluster. So all this uh, is very flexible and we can adapt uh, the, the deployment on different uh, environments. And uh, of course, at the end is the Elasticsearch cluster that has uh, the only access to the cluster is through uh, uh, the search engine and the, the controller. So uh, just to get close to the and part, we did also uh, some brief uh, evaluation, some benchmark on both of indexing and searching process. Uh, the indexing process, uh, we managed to uh, go through a full load of the documents of the 50 million documents in less than two days using the JSON uh, fragments. So that basically divided by 10 uh, the delay. So that was uh, a very good uh, step in uh, the optimizations that we can uh, implement. And then on the search performance, we used the uh, NeoLoad platform to simulate uh, several uh, um, users, uh, several concurrent users. Uh, we went from 20 up to 400 users and uh, different complexity of the queries. Basically, the most complex um, queries are related to the level of implication of uh, different aggregations. Uh, the average time that we, uh, we can uh, achieve was then less than 200 milliseconds. And for uh, a global collection like this and for specific queries, uh, we consider that it's uh, reasonable because uh, the needs uh, on the application layer are, um, are quite uh, precise. So uh, the curators, they, they have very precise queries that they typically use. So uh, basically, um, the, the response time, as long as it's, uh, we, we can respect this boundary of 200 milliseconds, uh, it's, it's uh, sufficient for, for them. We are a bit different than uh, the use case of, uh, of a website where the responsivity should be much uh, higher and the response time should be uh, much lower than, than this. Um, just a snapshot of the results of our evaluation. Uh, what this benchmark uh, showed uh, something very uh, interesting and that confirmed our uh, model is that more users we added uh, in the concurrent uh, queries, we uh, observed that the curves are st stabilized around uh, these 200 milliseconds. So uh, overall, the infrastructure could hold uh, the, the load uh, for this uh, average uh, type of uh, uh, queries. Um, so to, to wrap up and conclude, um, I would say that our use case uh, looks like uh, 
like a puzzle of several uh, technologies, several challenges, several solutions. So um, each part of the puzzle in itself, maybe it's not revolutionary, but when we put all together, that uh, uh, gave us the satisfaction to have uh, a full uh, project with, uh, with um, um, uh, performance that are uh, globally uh, accepted. And uh, I, I listed here the, the five points that I would like you uh, to take away. First of all, that we mentioned a, a data model which is specific to this use case, specific to this data, um, uh, entities graph, and the split of the graph uh, in, based on different functional views. The second point related to the facility of introducing a pre-processing step in uh, using these JSON fragments. Uh, this uh, brought us uh, an important uh, optimization in the indexing process. The third point, the usage of these transformations, GSLT transformations in both sides at indexing part normali for norm normalizing the document, but also for the query implementation. And a uh, search API that uh, it's a sim simplified wrapper uh, for Elasticsearch. And the search relevance, which is ongoing uh, in this moment. Thank you very much. And if we have some time for questions. Thank you, Radu. Wonderful. Uh, so now we have a little time to ask him. But first, yeah, like you did, can you sign? Uh, give me a sign, then I will come over and hand you the microphone. We had it in the last one that the people were already asking, and the people outside online can't hear any question. Yeah? So. We start with you, and then have a little sign, and I come by with a microphone. Thank you. Um, in the, uh, the NeoLoad picture that you showed, yes. maybe you go back to it. I'm just um, there was sort of like a jump spike on the fourth step up, and then it dropped back down. Do you know why that might have happened? Like here, when uh, yeah, generally that happens when um, when you add new. Um, new users. Okay. So there is a small gap when all of a sudden you have more queries coming up in, into the pipe. So by the time that the system is able to adapt and pile up the, the query uh, the treatment, uh, there is a delay where, where the, the responsing time increases. And then the Elasticsearch cluster basically it's going slowly, slowly, and uh, pick up uh, all the, those new queries that uh, arrived in bulk. And then after a while, uh, after a couple of uh, seconds, then it's stabilized again to to, an, to a certain average. Okay. So that's how, how we interpreted that, and it's quite consistent because we can see on the top curve. You see when new um, virtual users were added by the system, you have these spikes. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Um, as I understand, um, splitting the graph meant that you have different types of documents in, in your index. Yes. And did uh, any of the queries you tested in your performance tests involve uh, joining joints for these documents, like a query on content and uh, assessments related to of this content? Yeah, that, that's a very, very good question, and that's one of uh, our challenges whenever we uh, define a new type of query, because at the application layer, we might say, well, it's easy, I just want to, uh, to join different events with different concepts, for instance, and then how do we implement that? Then it becomes complicated when we try to look under. And so what we do, what we did for this, there is no general solution for all the combinations because some combinations could be very complicated. What we did, first solution, we we used nested documents in uh, in Elasticsearch, but we um, we use them with care. Uh, so uh, we tried to not to have uh, too many uh, dependencies and not to have too large object as objects associated to these uh, declared as nested objects. So that would be the, the main uh, uh, answer. But then uh, it's, it's always a trade-off, uh, because more 
nested you add, more complicated uh, becomes afterwards. You have a slight decrease in performances. And also what's most penalizing is the updates that if ever you need to do on one side or the other of the join, uh, it becomes a bit more difficult to, uh, to manage all that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you preferred the nested documents feature um, compared to the traditional join that would also be available. Yes, yes. And then the, that was a trade-off that we did also with, uh, um, with the stakeholders, with the curators, uh, to try to find which are the most uh, efficient joins and the simplest ones that we can put in place and while keeping the same performances. So first of all, thank you for your talk. And when we talk about like graph search, it always comes to my mind like how distance between nodes in the graph is involved with relevance. Now you, you put like, okay, relevance work ongoing, so maybe my question is like not much or enough for the, the point of your work, but how are you taking into account the distance between nodes when ranking the uh, the nodes themselves, right? So when you search for something in the graph, mm -hmm. and then some of the nodes are more distant than others, and do you take into account like links between nodes, and and on and on and on? Uh, yes, it's inter it's a very interesting point of view. Um, I'm trying to to see how we we m try to model this because. Actually, we don't really have um, a notion of distance um, per se. I, I mean, in the process of flattening the graph, uh, we were not really uh, heading to have the shortest distance in between the, the nodes. It was mostly um, uh, based on the needs and the way of being able to associate uh, some specific elements to the main elements. So for instance, if I have uh, an index of instances, what we call the instances, generically, um, we didn't go to the uh, longest path in the graph to see which are the events associated and which are uh, some other concepts associated to events and some other texts related to the concept that are related to the events and so on. Um, at some point, we limited this, uh, this path to uh, um, a size of two or three but this is really the, the, the rule of thumb that we, we implemented that uh, because we knew from the beginning that more we increase the, this distance, more we increase the complexity of the documents. So then the trade-off was uh, instead of having this, we decided, okay, we do another cut in the graph and then we will, um, uh, the queries, we will uh, use them to a different collection, to a different index. And also this is in illustrated in the application. So the user will have the, the possibility to interrogate, to, to query uh, mostly some instances that only have some text and basic events associated. And on the other hand, there is another facility that can, in, that can query the concepts, the global ontology of concepts, uh, which is richer in terms of metadata and in terms of documents, but it doesn't go backwards to different links of uh, events, uh, instances, and so on. So I, I would say uh, everything is a matter of trade-off, always keeping in mind the performance that you might have uh, later on in the query. So uh, thank you, Raul, thank you. again. Thank you for listening.